Let me tell you about a small town on the northeast coast of England that radically altered the history of the world. Twice, two times, a thousand years apart. I'm going to start talking about Conan the Barbarian. What has he got to do with history? History's boring, right? Conan the Barbarian was actually based on a real guy, like the most amazing adventurer of the medieval world. And his name was Harold Sigurdsson. There are a host of parallels between the two. Both fought their first battle at 15 years old. Both traveled the known world as mercenary adventurers. Both were huge men, massive, massive guys. Both were extremely charismatic. They inspired incredible loyalty in their followers and both became kings. Sigurdsson was reputed to be over seven feet tall, as his sagas describe him as being five L's high. Now an L is the distance between your elbow and the tip of your middle finger, also known as a cubit in the uh, ancient world. On the average man, this is usually around 18 inches. I'm actually 19 inches, but you know, there you go. Sigurdsson, like Conan, he did plenty of crushing the jeweled crowns of the earth beneath his sandal feet. Not that he wore sandals. He wasn't a hippie. Well, actually, he kind of was a hippie because the Vikings had some very egalitarian rules, at least for the time, compared to other societies. Of course, all the enslavement and the murder and the raping kind of puts a dent in this hippie hypothesis. But uh, the beginnings of social democracy were certainly there. I mean, he might have worn sandals when he was fighting in the Mediterranean and Asia Minor. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. He spent time as a mercenary warlord in Eastern Europe. And uh, he rose to command the Varangian Guard, which was the personal bodyguard of the Emperor of Constantinople. Byzantium, I should say. He fell in love with princesses, and rumour has it that he even shagged an empress, which is uh, pretty good going. His exploits in battle were absolutely legendary. For example, he was in, I think it was besieging a city in Sicily, and it was a very well fortified town. But he noticed that the thatched roofs, there was a lot of birds nesting. So he gave orders to capture these birds. He attached burning tapers to their bodies and then released them. So they flew back to their nests and set the city alight. Now, this sounds a bit cruel for the old birds, but when you're, when you're safeguarding the, the lives of your men with such ingenuity, that inspires incredible loyalty, almost fanatical loyalty. He would besiege in another town that they, they couldn't breach the walls. So he feigned death and, and appealed to their Christianity to allow him to, to be buried in their uh, church graveyard. Um, this tactic was recently fictionalized in an episode of uh, Vikings on the History Channel. And it was attributed to the guy in there, but it was actually Harold Sigurdsson that had done this. Many historians describe his death at the Battle of Stamford Bridge as the end of the Viking era. It was only after his death he became known as Hard Rada, which means hard ruler or stern council. Now this is Scarborough Castle, pugnaciously jutting out into the North Sea on this huge headland. It was built on the ruins of a Roman signal station by Henry II in the 12th century, a little less than 100 years after the Norman invasion. And the Norman invasion is important because at that same time it was here that Sigurdsson landed on the beach with 300 longships, about 8,000 men. Rather than assault the defences head on, he came up to the castle headland, where it wasn't, there was no castle here at the time, and built huge bonfires and when they were burning fiercely, he pushed them down onto the village below, setting that alight. And as the people fled, he cut them all down and killed every man, woman and child. Then he sailed 70 miles to the south, up the Humber, and then its tributary, the Ouse, to York, where he was finally defeated by the, an English army that had speed marched 200 miles up from London upon hearing of the uh, destruction of Scarborough. Other damage you can see to the castle was inflicted at the beginning of World War I by the German high seas fleet, who uh, launched a small campaign of offshore bombardment of Scarborough, Whitby and Hartlepool in order to draw up the Royal Navy and act as a diversion while other um, German ships um, laid mines up and down the coast. Because the East Coast shipping lanes with Middlesbrough and Newcastle 
and those industrialised areas was very important and uh, vital to the war effort. There were 592 casualties, of which there were 137 people were killed. Unfortunately for the Germans, this galvanised British resolve, and the slogan, Remember Scarborough, was used on recruitment posters all over the country. This is a remarkable parallel, I think, to the Hadrada story. Because if the last great Viking had been successful, the entire political landscape of Britain would have been changed. It would have developed very differently. And of course, this would have influenced the development of the British Empire, the largest and most influential the world's ever seen. Now, whether one thinks imperialism is good or bad is, is immaterial. The influence is undeniable. And if that influence had had a completely different flavour, or indeed hadn't occurred at all, the whole world would be dramatically different. Exactly the same could be said for the Empire's in involvement in the First World War. So with these two unfortunate events, the sleepy seaside town of Scarborough, tucked away on the northeast coast of England, fired up the population and had a pivotal role in how global history unfolded twice two times, a thousand years apart. And let's be honest here, for a, a little town of shopkeepers who sell ice cream and argue about feeding seagulls and picking up dog shit, that's pretty badass, don't you think? <laughs>